Hello and welcome back to the second installment in this video about the death of Lars Wilks and the two Swedish policemen who were his bodyguards at the time of the death. Andreas Gustafsson and David Omelius. I don't know why the Swedish police wouldn't release their last names. In America we honor fallen servicemen. Now, if you haven't seen the first video, please go ahead and look at that before you continue with this one, because here I will go into depth. But let me also say that uh, it's been over a month since I discovered that this was not an accident. The police said in June, June 15th, I think it was, the prosecutor of the case, Per Nichols, of the Department for Special Investigations. That's a department of the police that is directly reporting to the minister, Morgan Johansson. And their mission is to investigate the police, prosecutors, judges, politicians, and other high people in society. So why? Why was the death of a person they were protecting along with two officers investigated as a crime committed by the police rather than against the police. Why was it investigated as if the policemen had committed the crime when there were two servicemen who had fallen victims who were dead? That is a question that I think every reporter has to ask. Now, when I found this out, I made the video, video number one. I prepared the material, a lot more material. Obviously, I did not touch the crime scene. The house in question is a crime scene. I didn't touch it. I gave the material to the police. I reported it to all relevant instances of the police in Sweden and I waited and then I went back out the other day to look and it seems to me they have done nothing no police tape nothing they have just ignored it so I decided to take this to YouTube and that's why I published the video and now I will continue to report on this case but I urge everyone, do not touch the crime scene. The house, Mr. Hultsödegård, is a crime scene. Now, there are a few issues. I will show you a little bit more about that. Let's start by looking at Mr. Hultsödegård a little bit more, and then we'll come back to the audio. What you see behind me is the part of the E4 where Lars Wilks and the two bodyguards died on October 3rd, 2021. They came from your right, traveling from the north to the south. Right where that lorry is, but fast, like that one, or even faster. And right behind where they disappear out of view behind me. A tire exploded, they lost control came over to the opposite side, crashed against the lorry and died. Here, where I am now, there is a house. And in this house, there are some things I would like you to see. First out is this shooting table. As you can see, this is the shooting table. I don't know if you can see through the plastic, but inside it continues. And here they have pieces of wood arranged so that they can get a platform. Inside there are chairs. Walking closely I can see through the plastic window. And if we turn around, there you have the E4. The distance is about 130, 140 meters. Now, we walk around this side of the house.
when we come around the house on this side, what we find is another shooting table. In this case, the hatch is not plastic, but a green wooden thing. Walking closely, we see that clearly this is a construction made for a purpose. Obviously, it makes sense to hide inside when you shoot a rifle, but the sound, the flame, the explosion from the muscle of a 50 BMG is too much to take inside. It has to go outside. So why do I say 50 BMG all of a sudden? Well, look here. What do we have here? Bullet holes. And here I have a half inch rod. Goes through. Goes through with contact. Get stuck in there. I can't see now where it's pointing at, but that's where the bullet left went. You look at the windows, you see that on every side of the house. Let's go around and look. Here's a window where there's actually nothing covering it. That's the staircase down to the basement. Now, if you look on the second floor up there in that window, they left an opening in the bottom right corner to enable watching from inside and out. This one is blocked up. The bathroom is not blocked. This one is blocked, but there is an opening, so... Not much left. Uh, there is a chair is, or a two-seat sofa, it looks like, in here. So somebody could have been sitting in here watching if anybody came. Second floor, it's all blocked. The watching point is here of the sofa. sofa. Here, all blocked, all blocked. Just one watch out spot on that side of the house and here as we saw originally the shooting place and up there on the second floor there is a piece of black board that's screwed on so it might be possible to open and close with a screwdriver I'm sure why they did it that way from the outside. But here they had a, a piece of plastic and a window in Sweden would have a hold to hold it open. This one has, you can see it. It's sitting right there. But it seems like for some reason they put this bungee cord here. From the distance, it seems that the purpose is to hold the window open. And there is a, a chair which might have the purpose to help enter it. So, after having looked a little bit at the house, you saw that they had probably, I would say likely, removed that piece of OSB from the window, moved it over to the edge of the forest, shot using that second shooting table with the green hatch shot against that OSB in order to adjust the rifle scope. Three shots, that's what it takes. And then they put it back and the holes were in it. That's my interpretation of it, of the reason why there are three holes and why there is a shooting table over there. Now, then they probably did, like I said in the original, Try to shoot from the other window towards the E4. They missed. It's an extremely difficult shot. And they changed tactics. How difficult is it? I spoke to a Swedish uh, competition shooter. And he said it's an uh, extremely diff difficult shot. It's not impossible, but I couldn't do it. And he's competing at the Olympic level. 
So they moved down to the beside the road and shot from there instead. And well, I'll get back to that, but let's let's do the analysis of the sound file now. First, let's look at the complete file. I'll put it down here, and we'll and see if we can see it in fair light where we have better magnification. Yes, here you go. And we'll amplify it a little bit like so and blow up the sound level so you can see the sound. See here. This is the first sound. Let's see if we can listen to it. Okay, that's it. Go back here. Now this here is the collision with the track and the sliding tires over the road. So we ignore that. I'm sure the police had got that part right, but this part the police ignored. So we have, as I said in the first video, one sound, five hundredths of a second later another sound, and twenty-two hundredths of a second after the beginning a third sound. And I had already concluded that the third would be the shot, because it sounds like it. Listen to this. Sounds like a shot, right? If we listen only to the first part, which is hard, but... Actually, you can't hear the difference between these first two. So what I've done here, in order to figure out what kind of weapon was used to shoot this... Let me go into a little bit of technicalities here. So there are a number of factors that determine how the sound of a shot will, will be picked up. The environment, the acoustic environment, if there are echoes, if there are trees that create diffuse sound, or if it's an open desert where the sound just disappears. The other thing, important thing, is the microphone. All the consumer microphones will basically automatically adjust the gain. So when the shot sound comes, they will turn down the gain and then gradually turn it back up again. So you will miss. If you have a field recorder, a professional field recorder, here you can set the gain manually or you can have automatic. But if you set it manually, then you will probably clip the high sounds. That's what happened here in what we are just going to listen to. And then, of course, we have the things we are interested in, the gun and the ammo. So let's listen in a little bit to Demolition Ranch, where he shot all his guns. I just picked up a few for reference. Desert Eagle, 1911G, 45 ACP, great 1911. Yeah, I just realized I'm going to have to shoot a bunch of 500 Magnums today. Yo! As you can see, and it's cool. Powerful rifle. Yeah, nailed that thing. These targets over here. I'm gonna shoot into the dirt on the on the hill. And then this one. This thing is freaking beast heavy. Now, in each one here on the bottom line, I have the shot sound from the Las Vilks case for comparison. Because, as I said, it's hard to hear. You have to really go in and look at the, at the sound curve. Let's take a look here to show you what I mean. I'll go in a fair light. And we'll zoom in. in the beginning of the shot. Okay, here you see what has happened here is that the sounds have been clipped. This clipping is because they used the field recorder with manual volume control, which means you don't actually know what's happening with the sound there. But you can see the frequency. And you can see that uh, compared to the shot from Las Vegas, it's a lot higher frequency. That's because of the distance to the microphone. 
in the last week's case it was a kilometer away which means that the high frequency gets absorbed during the way and only the lower frequency arrives below approximately 2000 hertz so you see in the upper one it was clipping for quite a long time the frequency gets gets lower but it's still being clipped for a long time it gets clipped here we're getting down to non-clipped sound where you hear the end of the shot that's the reflection coming back from the forest and from the hills up there so we need to <laughs> I wish I could have done these experiments here myself. When I moved to Sweden from the US, I live five miles from the accident location. That's the only reason I really took an interest in it. It happened right under my nose. When I moved here, I applied to bring all my guns from the US because I was doing this kind of work, you know, forensic analyzing shots, fighting crime. I was doing that in the US and I applied to the police for permission to bring the weapons. They denied it all and said that I was unsuitable to be a weapons owner, period. I have a concealed carry license in Florida, but in Sweden, they did not want me to have any weapon because I was dangerous. I wonder, dangerous for who? For the criminals or for the police? Let's get back to that. So, since I couldn't do this test myself in a scientific manner, I am a scientist after all, I work with acoustics, uh, I went to YouTube. Thank you all you who shoot on YouTube. And I hope you can improve and give you some tips. Use a field recorder, put it on manual, but put it a little bit away from the gun, like 10 meters, 50 feet or something like that away from the gun. Now, um, so I had to go and look for, uh, in this case, we have the same environment, the same microphone, a lot of different guns and different calibers. That's good. But since it was clipping, it wasn't exactly what I needed. I could, with the help of this, I could determine that the shot was made with a 50 BMG, which I already was expecting. But now it was, I kind of had proof that it was so. All the others have a too short sound. And as we'll see later, it has to do with the length of the barrel. So I could also say that it was a 50 BMG with a long barrel, not a short barrel. So good old 50 BMG. Yeah. He shot there, Demolition Ranch, with three different rifles, two Barrett, short barrel and long barrel, and with a servo. The one that matched clo most closely was the Barrett with long barrel. But now we'll get to the Remington R2MI, which is the new name for Bushmaster BA-50. And here? You see the difference in sound here is because of the environment. In this environment, there is nothing that reflects the, and diffuses the sound. Whereas in this one, it's a pretty normal environment, not as closed as in Demolition Ranch and not as open as in the desert in between. This one actually is rather similar. Now, this is the one that's most similar, except that this one has some rocks in the background that creates echo. You hear it's ringing back. But if we ignore the echoes, now we go in and compare this in Fairlight, and we can compare the Vilks case in the bottom with the shot here. We can see well, obviously the high frequency is missing in the Wilkes case, as I said. There. 
Here you see a high frequency content in the sound up into, until this point in, in one channel, left channel, and this point in the right channel. And this corresponds remarkably well with the bilk sound. A higher frequency here, and here's a shift right about here is a shift to a lower frequency in the sound. Now, this, the length of this, I've been analyzing here, comparing with different 50 BMG guns, and the length of this depends on the barrel length. How long time, my interpretation is that this reflects how long time you got gas streaming out above the velocity of sound. So when you shoot, if you look at, if we, when I looked at the Barrett, the Barrett is semi-automatic. The Serbo he was using was semi-automatic, but this one is a bolt action rifle. When you look at the semi-automatic, this high frequency sound stops already over here because that's when the, when the mechanism opens or the gas reaches the gas port to cycle in a new round in the rifle. When that happens, the pressure in the barrel drops and this stops. So from this, we can see that the shot here was made with a 50 BMG manual, either single shot or bolt action. And then if we continue here, we see this lower frequency and uh, You can see it's ringing a bit. We can increase here. You see it's ringing. And this, the frequency and ringing here varies depending on the gun. And in this gun, the Bushmaster BA-50, it's significant. And it's a specific frequency. And it's the same frequency in this video and in the Wilkes case. So we have, I would say, a high degree of probability that the shot was made with the Bushmaster BA-50 or the new name Remington R2MI. So what does this mean? Well, the, the Barrett is the most common, most spread uh, 50 BMG gun. That's the one the Swedish military is using. The Serbo is the most inexpensive. It's a lower cost, a little bit less metal. This one is a sniper rifle. It's made for long distance sniper shots. It also has the peculiarity that you can divide it like an AR-15 and get it in two pieces. And that way you don't have this long rifle to carry around. You can put it into something small, maybe a a carriage for a baby, walk around with it because it does weigh a few kilos. If you can put it in a baby stroller, perfect, perfect way to walk away, nobody notices. It's expensive, about $5,000. So, and the, it comes in two different uh, barrel lengths. In my judgment, this was the longer barrel they used, the 30 inch barrel. Now, Having identified the rifle, we can say that whoever did this was well financed. This was not somebody who just took the easiest way out. Now, after dealing with that issue, let's look at the impact here of the bullet. This is where it impacts. In this video, he shoots a Raufoss round, the armor-piercing incendiary round from Norway, which costs around $7,500, something like that. Not cheap. And when it impacts, it explodes. You see on the video, the, the impact, there it impacts. The sound is not perfectly synchronized here. See? It impacts and then it impacts also behind it. The bullet continues through the 
bulletproof glass. And by the way, he's shooting at bulletproof glass, which is to show that the car they were traveling in, the Range Rover Sentinel, is easily penetrated by this round. So there is the sound. Now, I didn't expect this. This was a nice surprise. But if we take the the sound from the Wilkes case, we extend it back to the impact part of it, and we compare the impact part with this Raufoss round, there, we actually have a similarity significant similarity i compared this impact with different rounds from the 50 bmg and this is the one that by far matches the best so i would venture to say that they shot it with a raufoss round then there is a second sound here oh by the way the raufoss round it now we have to get to the car the car does not have bulletproof rear window. The rear window is just impact proof against burglars. The bulletproof glass is right behind the back seat. So when the bullet entered the luggage compartment, it would have exploded. That's the sound we pick up here, the, the bullet entering the luggage compartment and exploding in the luggage compartment that may be and i predict that that is the reason why the wheel was affected the tire and perhaps it also damaged the gas tank because the gas tank should be around there and the incendiary so if the gas tank was caused to leak by the explosion then this may be the and lighting up of the gas witnesses said that they saw the car shake which is reasonable given that it took a bullet with an explosive and that smoke was coming out from it this audio and this bullet matches that description so now we have identified the rifle the caliber the rifle the model of rifle the length of barrel and the ammunition used.